Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the special music by one of your near to draw us with your loving kindness. We thank you that Jesus demonstrated his self-sacrificing love for us on Calvary. And as he was lifted up, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, we ask that you would fix our gaze upon him and that nothing would obscure or blur our vision. We pray that you would remove the veil of unbelief from our hearts, that which blinds our minds from being able to keep mind and heart stayed upon thee. Our desire is that we would be changed into the same image of from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of our God. And so we thank you for angels that are here with us that excel in strength. We pray for all the souls on the prayer list. We pray for our missing members and families today. And that as it was said that you would visit them and bless them and minister unto them where they are. And prepare for the spoken word. I pray that the word would be mixed with faith in those that hear it, that it might profit us. Again, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your truth. And we ask that we'll be sanctified by that truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Our message is entitled today, Heathens and Publicans. And I can tell that this will probably be split into two. This is a continuation of the series that we started dealing with the fellowship of the Spirit, the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're continuing church trials and discipline in the ministry of reconciliation and Christ's plan in order to bring about a healing of the breach, as it were. I think that some of the most difficult areas that we have in our Christian life, certainly our marriages, our homes, and church relationship. For we understand that the church is composed of the families of the believers in Christ. So we understand that the Lord wants us to be Christians first in our home. Then when we are able to come together and we're converted, we can strengthen one another. We can be edified by one another, exhort one another unto uh, godliness and holiness. And then, of course, our neighbors and the community and even the world at large. And so when we... Okay. Everything sounded really nice and good, but I will take heed to the sound technician. So, when we studied last, we were looking at the three steps in Matthew chapter 18. And we liken those three steps to the first, second, and third angel's messages. And we understood that when you get to the third step, Jesus said that if that unreconcilable individual or the unrepentant individual that refuses to cooperate with step one and step two, and they neglect to hear the church, it says, let that individual be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican for whatsoever thou shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And we talked about the binding as a separation, as a cut off, as a removal from that particular church uh, fellowship. And there's a reason why Jesus used the language of heathen man and publican. And so we're going to continue our journey today, going through the scriptures, we're going to begin to identify heathens and publicans. Publicans is more of a New Testament 
term, but heathens you will see are all throughout the Bible and even, of course, in both Testaments. And so I want to begin today with you by going to Leviticus chapter 26. This is the first time in the Bible that we hear the definition or the terminology of heathen being used in the scriptures. Obviously, we're not going to go through every text that deals with heathen. I will leave that up for you to do, but this is just going to jumpstart us in our introductory study dealing with heathens and publicans. And so the Bible tells us, beginning here in verse 38, Leviticus 26 and verse 38, and the word of God says, and you shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your friends shall eat you up. Does it say the land of your friends? Enemy. Not at all, land of your enemy. So understand that in the Bible, a heathen was considered an enemy to the true believer of God. Of course, Israel or the Hebrews or the Jews, however you want to designate them, the Bible says that the heathen were their enemies. Now let's get more specific in relation to the land of your enemies, because we know that Israel were in many lands, scattered, driven away because of their disobedience, their rebellion to God and breaking his covenant, of which is the subject of Leviticus 26, by the way. The reason why they got themselves in the land of heathen was because they would not walk with God and they disobeyed his commandments, they rejected his covenant. More to say about that later. But as we look in verse number 45 of Leviticus 26, remember, you're going to perish in the land of your enemies. The land of your enemies will eat you up. This is when they were among the heathen. That means they were in a hostile environment. It was not a comfortable place. It was not, they were not friends. They were not associates. They weren't having a good time in or among the heathen in the land of their enemies. Verse 45 says, but I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of where? Egypt in the sight of who? The heathen that I might be their God, I am the Lord. So we understand that when they were among the heathen in the land of their enemies that will eat them up, that one of those lands or one of those nations were the Egyptians. Now we know that there was bad blood between the Israelites and the Egyptians. They certainly were not friends. They certainly uh, were not co-workers. They did not worship together. They didn't do any social things together whatsoever. The Bible says that the Egyptians are one of the lands of the heathen and that they were their enemies. And so this is the first time the word heathen is used in the Bible. And as we can see, it's talking about an enemy and talking about the Egyptians. Of course, we know the Egyptians held them in bondage. We know that they had them in servitude and in captivity and they oppressed and persecuted God's people and they opposed their God as well. The Egyptians certainly were not believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As we continue to look through the scriptures, we go to Psalms, the ninth chapter. Go with me to Psalms 9. And as you study the word heathen throughout the scriptures, you'll find that the majority of the text are actually found in Psalms. The psalmists, the various different writers, go at length to describe and to speak about the heathen. And in Psalms 9... Verse number five, and this is a Psalm of David. The Bible tells us in Psalms nine, verse five, thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the righteous. You've destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name for how long? Forever and ever. So there's a rebuke on the heathen. The Bible talks about 
them being destroyed and being wicked, and it says that their name has been put out forever and ever, or throughout all time as it were. If your name does not remain in the book of life, then you have no salvation. You have no eternal life. When it talks about their name being put out forever and ever, it's letting us know that they are not registered as followers of God or as servants of Christ. Neither do they have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. In Psalm 59, and looking together in verse number 5, the heathen are rebuked, the heathen are wicked, the heathen are destroyed, and their name is put out forever and ever. Psalm 59 and verse 5. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen, be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. Now, we would think that that's pretty harsh, is it not? Do you feel the love in that text? Doesn't it seem to contradict the character of God? Visit all the heathen, it says, and be not merciful to any of the wicked transgressors. Selah. This, of course, was written by David and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that a heathen is a wicked transgressor. And the only reason why one would not have mercy from God is because they do not cooperate with the conditions that God has laid down in his word for mercy. And what are those? The Bible says, seek ye the Lord while ye may be found. Or while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his wicked way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord for he will abundantly for he will have mercy upon him for he will abundantly pardon and then the Bible also says he that covereth his sins shall not prosper but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them the same shall have mercy and so here the heathen are wicked transgressors who do not seek the Lord. They do not ask for forgiveness. They do not want repentance. And therefore, that is the reason why they are not eligible for God's mercy. In Psalm 79, as we continue going through the book of Psalms, Psalm 79, beginning in verse number one. So far, we see that the heathen are enemies. We see that they're rebuked. They are wicked transgressors. There is no mercy for them. And their name is put out forever and ever. Psalm 79, and we're going to spend some time in, in this particular chapter. Psalm 79, beginning in verse number one. You'll notice at the beginning of the psalm that this is a psalm of Asap. So David didn't write all the psalms. Asap is actually a Levite, a minister, and a musician in the Bible. So Psalm 79, beginning in verse number one, and here it says here, O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven. The flesh of thy saints unto the beast of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. Now, who were the neighbors that were round about Israel? Were they not the heathen? Let's continue on. Verse 5, how long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon who? The heathen that have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy what? 
So here, understand this, that the heathen do not know God. They do not call upon his name. There is no devotional life. They do not study his word to know him. They do not pray to him. They do not serve him or worship him. To the, to the heathen, the God of Israel is a foreign, unknown God. Now, this does not mean that they don't have a devotional life or that they are not religious, because we will see in just a moment that the heathen are very religious, just not the right type of religion. But the Bible says, pour out your wrath upon the heathen, verse 6, that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. Why? For they have devoured Jacob and laid his dwelling and have laid waste his dwelling place. So the heathen were a desolating power. They were a persecuting power. They annoyed, they frustrated, they harassed, they tempted, they mocked the people of God. The Bible says they've entered into your inheritance, into the holy temple. They have defiled it. They have laid it waste. They've shed blood round about Jerusalem like water in the streets. They've given the flesh of your saints to the beast of the earth. Pour out your wrath upon them because they have not known thee and the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. Now, if you just hold your place in Psalm 79, let's go to Psalm 75 and let's look at this wrath. What is this wrath that is going to be poured out upon the heathen? And in this text, among other descriptions, the heathen represent a people that do not know God. Neither do they call upon his name. So again, they don't pray to God. They don't communicate with God. There is no devotional relationship with the God of Abraham. And the Bible says wrath is being poured out upon them. And if I may say as well, it's not that the heathen can't know God. It's not that they don't have an opportunity to know God, but rather that they refuse to know him or acknowledge him or even to call upon his name. In Psalm 75, we're looking at verse number 8. We're talking about this wrath that's poured out upon the heathen. Psalm 75, verse 8 says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture. And he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof, all the holy of the earth, shall wring them out. All right, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So what is this cup that is in the hand of the Lord? And the wine is red, full of mixture here, and the wicked are going to drain the dregs thereof. Every drop that is in this cup, they're going to have to drink it. What is this cup, this wrath that's poured out upon the heathen? We know it better in Revelation 14.9. What does Revelation 14.9 say? Let's go to Revelation 14.9. Revelation, we're going to come back to Psalms, but Revelation chapter 14 Pour out your wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee and the kingdoms of the earth that call upon thy name because they have laid Jacob waste and made his dwelling place desolate. So they have not known God, they have not called upon him, and they've also destroyed or have sought to desolate and to obliterate the house of Jacob. Revelation 14, 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the what? Wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his what? Indignation and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of 
of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up day, uh, forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the what? Mark of his name. So the cup of his indignation, that wrath that is poured out upon the heathen, ultimately is the seven last plagues that comes because of not knowing God or calling upon his name, which means you will ultimately receive the mark of the beast in the right hand and in the forehead. You'll worship the beast and his image. And that final punishment, that final separation for refusing to know God or call upon his name will be eternal separation. And you will be as though you never existed. And mark that in verse 11 it says they have no rest day nor night because they worship the beast in his image. We're going to come back to the no rest for worshiping the beast in his image. But please return to Psalms and let's go to Psalm 79. When Jesus used the illustration of heathen, man, and publican, that was very severe. That was not meant to be a compliment. That was not meant to be as a good thing. Regard them as a heathen man and a publican, the Bible says. As though they do not know God. As though they have not called upon his name. As though they're now counted among those that oppose the work of God as well as his people. But let's go back to Psalm 79, and we're going to continue now in verse number 8. Psalms 79 and verse 8. It says, O oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should who? The heathen say, where is their God? Let him be known among who? The heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants, which is shed. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee according to the greatness of thy power. Preserve thou those that are appointed to die and render unto our neighbors or the heathen sevenfold. How many fold? Sevenfold into their bosom their reproach wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So they have shed the blood of the saints. They've reproached the Lord. They said, where is their God, you claim to worship the true and living God. Well, where is he? Why doesn't he deliver you from our power? Our gods are mighty and stronger than your God. Where is your God? And the psalmist prayed, verse 12, and render unto our neighbors sevenfold. Anyone know what sevenfold means? What does sevenfold mean? Seven times. Hmm, seven times? Any idea where the psalmist might be getting that language from? Render unto our enemies the heathen seven times? Leviticus chapter 26. The curse of Moses. And where do we see that prayer actually being answered? Where the heathen gets seven Fold or seven times plagues for their sins. Is it not in the seven last plagues of Revelation 16? Those that get the mark of the beast and worship his image, they'll receive the seven last plagues. That's based upon the seven times of Leviticus 26. And so here, render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom. Punish them seven times as we were punished for seven times because of being like the heathen. And we will talk more about that in just a moment. Continuing on, verse 13. So we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Bible 
goes on to tell us in Jeremiah, Jeremiah the 10th chapter, reiterating what we read earlier in Psalm 79 about those that do not know him or those that do not call upon his name. I want you to notice in Jeremiah 10, 25, again, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 25. The Bible says, pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. And the reason why they devour Jacob, the reason why they eat him up and consume him and leave his habitation desolate is because they do not know the God of Jacob, neither do they call upon his name. And this is not just talking about non-Israelites. This could be talking about our families and our homes if we don't have devotion. Because the Bible says, pour out your wrath or your anger or indignation upon the heathen that have not known thee, nor call upon thy name. Is Christ a household name in our families? Do we sing his praises? Do we give testimony? Do we read his word? Do we pray? Do we worship together? Those homes that do not have morning and evening devotion will receive the same wrath and indignation as a heathen that does not know him or call upon his name. And then until you will then begin to devour Jacob, you will attack and will persecute God's people. Why? Because you don't know him. You don't call upon him. You don't worship him. You don't serve him. Which means then that by default you have to worship Satan and call upon him and serve him. The Bible tells us as we back up to verse number one regarding the heathen that do not know thee and the families that do not call upon thy name. In Psalms it said the kingdoms that do not call upon thee or know thee in Jeremiah says families. So again, families and kingdoms are used interchangeably. And of course, those that do get the wrath and indignation ultimately will receive the mark of the beast. So if we don't know him, and if we don't call upon his name and have worship in our homes and with our children, then we can place ourselves in a position where we'll drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation because we worship the beast at his image. In Jeremiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of who? The heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. The work of the workmen and the hands of the founder, blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. But the Lord is the what? True God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. 
Dropping down to verse 14, every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image for his molten image is falsehood and there is no breath in them. They are vanity, the work of heirs. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. For he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. And so why are we not to learn the way of the heathen? Because you'll become like the heathen. You'll adopt their customs, their ordinances, their doctrines. You'll worship their gods, which are no gods, but rather that which their hands have made. And those gods that have not created the heavens and the earth will not be able to abide his indignation. And the reason why they worship these dumb idols that have no breath in them, no power in them, no ability to redeem or save, is because they have not known the God of Jacob, neither do they call upon his name. And so the Bible tells us that we are not to learn the way of the heathen, but unfortunately Israel failed in learning this lesson for we find that in Psalms 106. Go with me to Psalms 106 again. Psalm 106, there was never to be an alliance with the heathen. There was never meant to be companionship or co-partnership co with one another. The ways of the heathen were always a snare and a temptation to Israel. And we notice in Psalm 106, verse 34, Psalm 106, 34, they did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among who? The heathen, and what did they do? Learn their works. Uh-oh. God already told them, don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't be dismayed by the signs in heaven. Don't wonder after the sun, moon, and stars. Don't worship them like the heathen have done. But instead of destroying the nations, the Bible says they were mingled among them like iron is mixed with miry clay, and the Bible says that they learned their works, and what was the result? Well, if you learn something at the end, don't you graduate? Don't you get a certificate? Don't you get a diploma? So what was their diploma? What was their certificate? What was their grade that they received by learning the way of the heathen? Notice what it says in verse 37, or rather verse number 36, it says, And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto angels, sacrificed them unto devils, and they shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and they went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the what? Wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Notice that the heathen hated Israel. They hated the God of Jacob. Every, every chance they got, they mocked the God of heaven. They reproached the God of heaven, they magnified themselves against the God of Israel. And the Bible says that in verse number 42, their enemies also oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their hands. Many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. So this is what happens when Israel is mingled among the heathen and they learn their works. They end up idolaters. They end up worshiping devils. They end up sacrificing their precious children to devils and shedding innocent blood. This was Satan's desire. Because Satan would use the heathen to shed their blood and to persecute them. 
But usually when that happened, that would draw Israel closer to God. Because oftentimes in times of trouble, in times of crisis, we might remember God and we might want to understand that he is our defender and our protector and our shield from the enemy. But Satan wasn't satisfied with that. He says, I need Israel to become just like the heathen. Instead of the heathen shedding the blood of, of Israel's sons and daughters, I need Israel to kill their own children. And that's what happens when we worship devils. Parents don't understand that the children are always going to be affected by what we do. You can't just worship, say, I'm going to worship idols and worship the devil, and there will be no casualty. No, your children's blood will be shed. And so you see that same wrath that God had purpose for the heathen that did not know him nor call upon his name, that same wrath came upon Israel themselves because they became like the heathen. And yet the heathen that hated them ruled over them, and they were subject unto their enemies. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, go with me to Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, beginning here in verse number 30. The reason why Satan wanted to destroy the seed of Israel is because he was trying to stop Jesus from coming the first time. Satan understood the prophecy that it would be the seed of the woman that would bruise the seed or the head of the serpent. So he knew that the Savior was going to come through the line of Israel, through Judah in particular. And so he thought that if I can get them to destroy their own children, give their children up in sacrifice to me, then I'll stop the Messiah from coming to destroy my kingdom and to end my empire and ultimately to destroy me and bruise my head. And so the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel 20, beginning in verse 30, Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers? And commit ye whoredom after their abominations? For when you offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute yourselves with all your idols even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. And that which cometh into your mind shall not be at all. That ye say, we will be as the what? The heathen as the families of the countries to serve what? Wood and stone. We will be like the heathen as the families that serve wood and stone. Supreme insult to God. That would break his heart over and over again. To say to a stock, thou art my father. And to a stone thou hast brought us through. But we will be as the heathen that serve wood and stone. And what did God do with Israel when they said they wanted to be like the heathen, like the family that served wood and stone? What happened to them? Second Kings chapter 17 gives us the history of what befell Israel. The Lord says, if you want to be like the heathen, you want to worship wood and stone, I will send you among the heathen. Go live with them and worship their gods. But don't cry unto me in the time of your trouble. Go and cry unto the gods of the heathen that you have made for yourselves to worship. When we look in 2 Kings chapter 17, beginning... In verse 13, the second King 17, 13, the Bible says, yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers saying, turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law, which I commanded your fathers, which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. 
Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statues and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after who? Went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. Do like who? Like the heathen. Verse 16, and they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also, Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statues of Israel, which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. God came to a point when he had to disfellowship Israel. He gave them up to their desires. He gave them up to their other gods and lovers that they had chosen over him. And now they're in captivity. Their enemies that hate them are ruling over them. They are subject unto them. It's a time of persecution, a time of trouble for Israel. And Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, tells us in his Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 1, please go there, Lamentations 1, it's between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Lamentations, the first chapter. There comes a time where there's a separation. There's a cutoff. Was it forever? Was it indefinite? It was not indefinite. It was not forever. But God had to put Israel out of his sight. And he'll put us out of his sight as well. He'll remove the candlestick from out of its place. Except we repent and do the first works. And so after God disfellowshipped and severed Israel from among him and from their land that he gave to them, the heritage of Jacob their father. The Bible tells us here in Lamentations 1, beginning in verse 1, how doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces how has she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she have none to comfort her. Have mercy. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She dwelleth among who? The heathen. She findeth no rest. Findeth no what? Remember Revelation 14, not the third angel, they have no rest day nor night because they worship the beast in his image. They have no rest. And then it says, all her persecutors overtook her between the straits. Who were Judah's persecutors? The heathen. But Judah's persecutors were also her lovers and her friends of which she committed adultery against Jehovah. And now they don't want nothing to do with her. Now they hate her. They despise her. It's almost as though they want to burn her flesh and eat her with fire, or burn her flesh with fire and eat her, as it were. 
the heathen were her persecutors. They were her oppressors. They were her enemies because the heathen were controlled by Satan. And Satan had no love or mercy or compassion for Israel whatsoever. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse number 10. Verse 10 says of Lamentations 1, The adversary hath spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things, for she hath seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary, whom thou didst command that they should not enter into thy what? Heathen weren't allowed in the congregation. Did you catch that or did you miss that? Heathen were not allowed in the sanctuary. Or in the congregation. Why? Because when they enter into it, they defile the place. How did they defile the temple? We're going to look at that in just a moment. Why did God say, heathen cannot, allow, cannot be allowed in the sanctuary in the congregation? What, did God not love the heathen? Did he not have a desire to reach the heathen? Yes, through Israel. But there was a reason why heathens... And publicans were not allowed in the congregation or in the sanctuary. Why is this? Please turn with me to the book of Ezra. Ezra, the sixth chapter. Ezra, what chapter are we going to? The heathens were persecutors. They trampled the law of God. They did not know God. They didn't call upon his name. They were unmerciful. They were cruel. They were wicked. They were oppressors. They were idolaters. And they were not allowed in the sanctuary or in the congregation. When we look in Ezra chapter 6, the children of Israel spent 70 years among the heathen. 70 years in Babylonian captivity. The time of the end had come for them to be delivered and to be redeemed and released and to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, even the streets and the walls in troublous times. And there's a reason why there was a time of trouble while they were rebuilding Jerusalem. We'll look at that in just a moment. But Ezra 6 and beginning here in verse number 21. It says here, and this is actually the time of the Passover, which the Passover had been suspended for 70 years. And now it's going to resume again. In Ezra 6.21, in fact, none of the feast days that pointed to the work of Christ or the, the redemption plan of the ages was ever observed during that 70-year time period. We have no record of Passovers, of Day of Atonement, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Trumpets. Any of the feasts were being kept during the 70-year captivity. When we notice in Ezra 6.21, And the children of Israel which were come again out of captivity, and all such as had done what? Separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of who? The heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did what? Did eat. So notice... That Israel now, coming out of captivity, made sure that they would be separate from the filthiness of the heathen. Question, what was the filthiness of the heathen that Israel was seeking to be separate from? They understood that, listen, we can't have fellowship with the heathen. We can't worship with the heathen. We can't be companions or friends with the heathen. We know that's a snare and temptation that ultimately led to us being scattered among the heathen. So they said, we're going to be separate from the filthiness of the heathen. What was that filthiness? Ezra chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Ezra, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse 1. What was the filthiness of the heathen that Israel understood we need to be separate from? We don't need to be united with them in their filthiness. We don't need to join with them in their idolatrous standards. Listen what the Bible says in Ezra 9, 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel 
and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Prezerites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. So notice, they knew that there needed to be a separation, but here someone comes to Ezra and says, listen, the priests, the Levites, those, those are the leaders, those are the ministers. And the people have still not separated themselves from the people of the lands, meaning their abominations. And then you have the eight nations of the heathen that are listed there. Now, how was it demonstrated that the people still had not had that separation from the abominations of the heathen that God had called for? Look at verse 2. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves, uh-oh, and for their sons, uh-oh, so that the holy seed have they what? Mingled themselves with the people of these lands, yea, the hands of the princes and rulers have been chief in the trespass, uh-oh again. The ringleaders of apostasy. You see, what had happened was, was that they said, okay, well, yes, we understand the heathen. They're, they're idols. They're abominable. They're enemies of our people and our religion. We understand that. But what the enemy said was, listen, let me do this. One of the ways that I can get Israel joined to the heathen or have the, the heathen mingled among them is to contract these marriages that are not sanctioned by God. Let me get them to marry into a heathen family. You don't understand how powerful this is unless you are married. Because when you get married and then there's children that eventually come, well, there's family functions. There's holidays. There's birthdays and there's events. And grandma and grandpa want to see the children. Problem is, is that grandma and grandpa don't worship the God of Abraham. Grandma and grandpa don't believe or practice health reform. Grandma and grandpa say, listen, you could watch whatever cartoons, whatever movies, whatever you want to do. Wear what you want to wear, go where you want, do what you want. And they're teaching them to be alienated from the God of Abraham and to worship their own gods. This is how idolatry gets established in the family. Because they're hearing mom and dad say one thing about how we should worship, how we should live, how we should conduct ourselves. We need to serve the God of heaven. But when they get around the heathen family members, they undo and they dismantle everything that you have sought to build up in your home. So whereas in your home you have an altar built to the worship of the God of Israel, but when they go among their family, they have an altar built to the worship of Baal. And now there's a conflict. Now there's confusion. Now there's a crisis in the family. This is what Satan wanted. He said, I will get them to marry each other. And listen, hold your place here. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2. There, see, we don't understand. You're, you're not just marrying into a family. Let the Bible show you what you're marrying into. Go to Malachi chapter 2. This is for those that are not married or contemplating marriage or not even thinking about it. That's great. But let's look at this principle right here in the Bible. What are you marrying into? Oh, I'm just marrying into the family. I'm not gaining, I'm not losing a daughter, I'm just gaining a son. Or I'm not losing my son, I'm gaining a daughter. Malachi chapter 2, notice what the Bible says. This was the reason why Israel fell into deep, deep apostasy. You talk about the familial ties of humanity. 
We talk about silken cords of affection. Listen to what it says. Malachi chapter 2. I'm going to begin here in verse 10. It says this. Have we not all one father? Hath not God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? How do you profane the covenant of your fathers? Judah have dealt treacherously and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved and hath married the daughter of a strange God. What did he marry? I thought he was just marrying that beautiful woman. That smart, pretty woman. She's so nice. She's so friendly. What did he marry? The daughter of a strange God. You're marrying into the religion. That's what God is saying. You're marrying into the religion. And he knows from Solomon that your heart will be turned away from my heart to the heart of their gods. That was Satan's number one strategy. Get them to mingle, get them to marry, get them to become one. Because he doesn't just want them to be one flesh, I want you to be one spirit and one mind. That's why it's serious. Marrying the daughter of a strange God or marrying the son of a strange God. It works both ways. We go back to Ezra. Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. Listen to what the Bible says. Ezra chapter 9, we're going to bring this to a close here and continue it. But Ezra chapter 9, Satan wanted to mingle the holy seed with the unholy seed. He wanted, this is how he corrupted Israel. He knew that those spouses would have great power and great influence over their husbands, or vice versa. And through that heathen man or heathen woman, that's now your spouse, now bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh, he knew that through that agency, he could turn away your heart from the living God, and it would be turned unto the gods of the heathen. Notice what the Bible says, beginning here in verse number 11. As we close up here, Ezra 9, 11, it says, which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophets saying, excuse me, let me back up to verse 10. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophets, saying, the land unto which you go to possess it is a clean land, unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Understand that what made the heathen filthy was their abominations. It was their idolatry. It was their lifestyle. That's, that's what made them filthy. That's what had a defiling influence upon themselves and upon Israel. It says, now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their well forever. Don't seek their peace. Don't seek their wealth. Don't seek their companionship. Or friendship, all of that is a snare. God is talking to the priests. He's talking to the Levites, the ministers that were chief in this trespass. It says that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou 
Our God has punished us less than our iniquity deserve. Praise God. And has given us such deliverance as this. Praise God again. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity or oneness or unity with the people of these abominations? Wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? And this is what Satan wants. He wants to destroy the remnant. Like a preacher friend of mine said, you, I don't know if you caught it. You might, have, you might have caught it. You might have missed it. But he doesn't want the remnant to exist. He wants to destroy God's people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony and faith of Jesus. He wants them destroyed. So I'm allowing the enemy to come into your home, be a part of your family. You'll be sleeping with the enemy. And who do you think will have a greater influence on your children? You, the God, that you worship the God of Abraham, or them that worship the God of Baal? Fifteen, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. But God was seeking to bring revival and reformation back to Israel. When you look at chapter 10, the next chapter, he even told them, and this is one of the only times I've ever seen it in the Bible, where there was a mandate of God to separate that had nothing to do with the violation of the seventh commandment in a physical sense. He told those men, you need to separate from those wives and from the children too. Under that circumstance, it was that serious. God wanted there to be a division and a separation from the heathen. Because unfortunately, God's people weren't winning the heathen, but the heathen were converting Israel. And so we're going to pause here, and we're going to continue. This is not the end. This is just preliminary as we continue to progress through the Bible to understand what Jesus meant when he said, if they neglect to hear the church, then let them be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. For whatsoever thou bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we come before thee. Thanking you for your word and for the light that it brings. Understanding that these things are not easy to be said. They're a hard saying. These things cut to the bone and narrow and our soul. That word of God is a double-edged sword because you're trying to separate us from sin. And when we become so identified with it, when it becomes our very being, it's as though we have to die in order for us to be free from it. And so, Father, as we begin today dealing with the heathen in general and understanding why there was a separation, why there was a division. It was for the spiritual safety of Israel. It was for their eternal good. It was to keep them from being defiled with the abominations, with the idols, which were a snare. The influence that the heathen had upon them was greater then oftentimes the prophets or the ministers or the priest or even the God of heaven could have upon his people. And so, Father, I pray that as you identify 
the heathen, as you identify their customs and their manners and their ways, that we would make sure that we are separated from heathen influences, from heathen practices and customs that do not glorify God, but rather lead us into Satanism to worship the devil and to give our children in sacrifice to devils. Please forgive us. Please continue to educate us and to enlighten us. And we pray, Father, that your will would be done for Israel, that you would have a people that are purified, made white, and tried. A people that will not have many lovers, but will be presented as a chaste virgin unto Christ, that Christ would be able to have his way with his bride, with his wife, and not have to share her with the heathen, with other gods. Thank you for your love and thank you for your blessings and may you continue to abide with us and to educate us and to teach us and to revive us and reform us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.